I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. As many of you know, for the last several weeks, we've been exploring what are called the seven factors of awakening in the Buddhist tradition. And in the uh, list of them that is typically in this sequence, they are uh, mindfulness, investigation, energy, or what I would call making efforts, sustained effort, uh, bliss or rapture, tranquility, concentration, which means basically deep purification of the mind, deep absorption states, including in non-ordinary states of consciousness that can be very liberating and insightful, and then last, equanimity. Those are the seven. So it's a list. We could take it at face value. Uh, the words on that list are all psychological. There are, none of them are inherently religious or certainly not metaphysical or cosmic or you know, beyond the natural, ordinary plane of reality. Uh, we could take them at face value. Around each of these factors, because they're factors, they're causes, uh, is a lot of teaching. And uh, despite all the details and all that teaching, the central notion is that you, and I, and we can all cultivate these qualities, both as states of being in the present, states of mindfulness, the state of investigation, the state of energy, tranquility, and so forth. Um, and we can also cultivate them as traits, trait mindfulness, trait investigation, trait application, energy, effort, trait happiness, even joy, and et cetera, et cetera. So how do we do that? How do we develop these qualities inside ourselves and um, make use of them? Now I see Elaine's question here. Uh, there is a certain amount of language in the various Buddhist lists that you know, item one leads to item two, which leads to item three. You know, there's some lovely stuff about that. Uh, it is also true that um, of these seven qualities, there is initially a, there is a kind of loose sequence developmentally where we been we begin with mindfulness, and then as mindfulness is increasingly established, sustained present moment awareness, we start investigating our reactions. We start investigating you know the grosser aspects of them, what makes us happy, what makes us suffer, and then we really start investigating the nature of experience as made of parts that are connected and changing, processes, interdependent processes that are empty of inherent identity or solidity or ownership. And in that investigation, we lighten up in our relationship to phenomena, including the phenomena of our own experiences, moment by moment by moment. And then that can lead to or open up a space for the importance of sustained effort, and then that can bring us to a kind of joyfulness, which then can settle into tranquility, which then opens us into a deep you know, state of concentration, the fruits of which are a profound and growing um, equanimity, a kind of fundamental balance, even as unbalancing things are occurring around you. So we could, we could tell that story. We could tell that story. And as Brenda notes wisely, Dr. Brenda, uh, these seven interact with each other. Uh, they're factors of each other. They're in, they intertwine. All right. So that's, that's context. Um, and so now let's dive in to what to me is a bit of an oddball factor on that list and startling in its placement on that list, including in a context of a certainly an early Buddhist tradition heavily dominated by monastic practice, which was austere and still is today in, the, you know, in its monastic forms in the Theravadan tradition. Austere, renounced, disengaged, dispassionate, certainly, uh, prepared to practice significant 
austerities, uh, one meal a day, a major meal a day, that's it. Um, wow, to include bliss or rapture as one of the factors. It's really quite remarkable. So I want to read to you, maybe, well, I, probably for me, one of my absolute favorite passages in the Buddhist canon uh, the canon being a collection of teachings, and it's commonly called the Pali Canon, P-A-L-I, as a language, one of the central languages of the written record of early Buddhism. And this is from the Majjhima Nikaya, which Majjhima just means middle length. Right? The discourses of the Buddha in the Pali Canon are not organized <laughs> by topic, you know, they're organized by things like how long they are. So these are the middle length discourses. And the one I'm going to read from has to do with the Buddha's very personal description of his own process of awakening, which will then create a frame in which I can talk about the fourth, I think. Yes, the fourth enlightenment factor, awakening factor, which in Pali is called piti, P-I-T-I. Um, this is uh, Majjhima Nikaya 36, uh, the greater discourse to Sachaka, however that's pronounced, a person that the Buddha was talking with and who was asking the Buddha about his own personal journey. And so let's see here. The part that I want to read to you is here. Okay. So um, let's see. So I'll start with uh, number 30, and you can follow along if you can find it. So basically, the Buddha is telling the story about his journey, and he was saying, you know, I thought to myself, this is the Buddha speaking, whatever ascetics or Brahmins in the past have experienced painful, racking, piercing feelings due to spiritual exertion, this is the utmost that I was dealing with at that time. There is none beyond this. And... Uh, whatever, uh, and I'll actually just kind of skip ahead, but by this racking practice of austerities in which the Buddha nearly died, by this racking practice of austerities, I have not attained any profound distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Could there be another path to enlightenment? besides the path identified in his time, in the Jain practices of his time, Jain, J-A-I-N, um, of austerities and renunciation, could there be another path? This is the turning point. This is the moment, this is the development of the middle way. The Buddha continues, I considered, I recall that when my father, the Sakyan, was an ethnicity or group, tribe, when my father the Sakyan was occupied, while I was sitting, probably as a boy, in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered and dwelled in the first jhana, which I'll get to in a moment. The four jhanas uh, comprise the uh, uh, path of uh, the aspect of right concentration, wise concentration in the Eightfold Path, the jhanas well-known, non-ordinary, but still well-known, deep states of consciousness. So the Buddha, as a boy, probably under the rose apple tree, entered into the first jhana, which is accompanied by uh, uh, applied and sustained attention with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. Could this be the path to enlightenment? I asked myself. And then following on that memory of being under the rose apple tree came the realization, this is indeed the path to enlightenment. And I asked myself, the Buddhist says, I asked myself, why am I afraid of that happiness that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states? And I thought, I am not afraid of that happiness that has nothing to do with sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. And I considered, it is not easy to attain that happiness with a body so excessively emaciated, he had nearly starved to death. 
And I ate some solid food, some boiled rice and porridge, traditionally, supposedly brought to him by a, by a woman who lived nearby. I ate some solid food, some boiled rice and porridge, and now at that time, five monks were waiting upon me, thinking, if our ascetic Gautama, his name, achieves some higher state, he will inform us. But when I ate the boiled rice and porridge, the five monks were disgusted and left me, thinking, the ascetic Gautama now lives luxuriously. He has given up his striving and reverted to luxury. The Buddha continues, <clears throat> Now, when I had eaten solid food and regained my strength, then, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered and dwelled in the first jhana. And there's a very specific description here, which is accompanied by applied and sustained attention with rapture and happiness. Rapture is piti, with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. And then with the subsiding of applied and sustained attention, I entered and dwelt in the second jhana, which has internal confidence and unification of mind, is without applied and sustained attention. It's without deliberate attention and has rapture and happiness born of concentration. And then he continues with the fading of, away as well of rapture, PT fades away. In the third jhana, I dwelled equanimous and mindful and clearly comprehending I experienced happiness with the body. I dwelled in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, the person in the third jhana is equanimous and mindful and one who dwells happily. So we have the fading away of rapture in the third jhana, but the presence of happiness, the word translated as happiness, which I'll get to. And then in the fourth jhana, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous passing away of joy and displeasure, I entered and dwelled in the fourth jhana, which is neither painful nor pleasant and includes the purification of mindfulness by equanimity. And then he continues uh, to say that he then had his own process of awakening that involved uh, reviewing his his own personal rebirths, reviewing the rebirths of many, and then realizing uh, the Four Noble Truths. A lot of drama here, a lot of, a lot of key points. And uh, you can go back and, and read a good translation I'm drawing on and slightly paraphrasing as I read in the Buddha's words from Bhikkhu Bodhi, extraordinary, wonderful, uh, translator of the of the Dharma. Uh, there are different English translations of some of those key terms, um, but the point I would like to highlight with you is, first of all, the teaching of the Buddha to welcome certain kinds of emotionally positive experiences, to appreciate them as factors uh, of awakening and all right in and of themselves. And there is a tendency sometimes I've found in spiritual practice and certainly in the in you know the Buddhist tradition to kind of be afraid of or shy away from uh, emotionally positive experiences, particularly intense ones. As a detail, here's a here's a warning. If a person is vulnerable to manic episodes, this is important, and bipolar disorder, true manic episodes, uh, Sometimes a trigger for someone who's vulnerable in this way of a genuine manic episode is an intensely positive experience. So if you imagine the range of experiences from minus 10 to plus 10, kind of zeros the neutral point in the middle, um, you know, things that are in the sevens, eights, nines, and even tens, that might trigger a manic episode for someone who's vulnerable there. But, lo you know, but less intense. The fives, the sixes, certainly the twos and threes and fours, definitely the ones are really okay. 
So other than that uh, warning here, uh, you know, the Buddha is encouraging us to, um, to find happiness. The second point is to pursue the distinction, which I'm now going to do in my exploration of the um, fourth enlightenment factor of PT, translated as bliss or rapture or joy. And there's a distinction between PT in Pali and Sukha, S-U-K-K-H-A. Um, Sukha is translated in various ways as happiness or contentment. Um, and uh, I want to share with you some of the distinctions there that are called out and then talk with you about the cultivation, frankly, of both of these qualities. I'm going to uh, freelance a bit uh, with, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, I think the awakening factor of happiness that's adjacent to the awakening factor of bliss, rapture, and joy. Uh, which is happiness, uh, in, or including kind of a quiet contentment. So, um, PT, rapture, is stimulating, it's exciting and energizing. And traditionally, in the Vasudhi Magga, which was written about a thousand years after the Buddha passed away, so around the fifth century in the Common Era, the Vasudhi Magga, uh, there are five kinds of, uh, or levels almost, of bliss that are described. Uh, weak bliss, you just kind of, maybe the hair stands up on your neck or you get the shivers. Uh, I, uh, uh, short bliss, um, you know, from time to time, uh, what they called going down bliss, which kind of explodes in the body like waves. You can see a growing intensity here. Exalting bliss makes the body jump to the sky and really intense. And then, you know, fulfilling bliss. Uh, it's like a huge flood of a mountain stream. Now, you may have experienced this. I have. And I find that some people are very prone to bliss uh, and other people, it's not so accessible to them. Fear not. And I find also that uh, for me at least, I began to encounter uh, PT um, while on meditation retreat. And it took me several days at least into the retreat by initially really focusing on absorption in the breath. and a very fierce application of, of attention, just applied and sustained, you know, breath after breath, minute after minute, throughout a whole meditation, throughout a whole day. And then kind of as that intensity was increasingly, you know, stabilized, then bliss began to arise. And it was intense. It, it is intense. Uh, it can come in brief waves. There can be a pulse of it or, you know, and again, people may share about experiences here, perhaps on retreat, you can feel, and, and I did, you know, on occasion, so a wash in bliss that it started to become almost overwhelming and even like almost hard to stand up <laughs> out of my chair when the meditation period ended and it was time to uh, do walking meditation or something else. So uh, the bliss can be really, really intense. Adjacent to it, though, is sukha. And the root of the word for sucrose or sugar in um, you know, Sanskrit is similar, sukha. And uh, there's a sweetness in it. And a very significant teacher for me, Christina Feldman, um, speaks of sukha on a range that moves from happiness to contentment to tranquility. And when a person starts to know what bliss is like, rapture is like, which for me at least has this ar ar arising, arousing quality and becomes more adept with it. Um, a person can literally, particularly if they're fairly intermediate or advanced in their own contemplative practice, you can explore a process in which you really concentrate, you really focus on something like your breath in a muscular way for 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes in a row. And then you can ask yourself this traditional question or statement, may 
PT arise. May bliss arise. Now, by the way, I can see Robin's question at five after uh, the hour. Uh, there's probably an overlap with the states of being that the Buddha was drawing on in the meditative traditions of his own time, 2,500 years ago. These states of being were well known at that time. And um, it, probably there are overlaps with other traditions. People talk about mystical rapture, um, you know, kriyas in the body and you know, yoga, uh, you know, just uh, kundalini rising, I don't know, just, you know, being being carried along by by energies or, or spirits, et cetera. There could be a lot of overlap there. Uh, I'm still looking for a good explanation uh, neurobiologically about what in the world is going on. Uh, and I have not found yet a compelling explanation. There are various theories and they're out there, but I don't know. I do know. I do know that many people from the Buddha and his teachers and, and their teachers before them all the way up to the present time, I do know that many people have experienced PT. And um, to continue with Christina's teaching, Feldman, um, it is possible if it interests you in your own med <coughs> meditative practice to play around with the sense of bliss or rapture, some kind of arising pulse. And then, if you want, let it quiet some and find out what's adjacent to it in terms of happiness, what kind of happiness. It's quieter, it's more subtle. And then see if happiness, perhaps, can soften into contentment. This was Christina's advice to me, and I found it extremely helpful in my meditation. And then can contentment even soften into tranquility? And she said, you know, it's actually, it's skillful means to be aware of the distinctions, the, this difference, not abstractly or theoretically, but in your body, in your experience. Like what is bliss like? What is happiness like? What is contentment like? And what is tranquility like? Uh, So to make a broader point um, and to talk about uh, you know, happiness adjacent to bliss or rapture, uh, why in the world would these uh, intensely emotionally positive experiences be recommended? Why uh, is bliss, I'll use the word bliss, it's, I think the closest English translation to what I've experienced. Um, why would bliss be a factor of awakening? Or in the uh, Theravadan five factors of the jhanas, these non-ordinary states in right concentration, why would of the five um, both bliss and happiness be factors of deep meditative absorption? The other three factors of deep meditation absorption, the jhana factors, are applying attention, sustaining attention, uh, bliss, happiness, and what's called unification of mind, singleness of mind, unification of consciousness, which is a sense of whoosh, the whole gestalt of your consciousness being present whoosh, as a single whole. And as those five factors really, really developed, we start to enter into what's called access concentration. We're starting to tip into a very non-ordinary state of awareness and then whoosh, all the way into the, the first jhana. Different teachers teach about the jhanas uh, in different ways. Um, you know, I think of them as authorities on this and there are different views and there are sort of arguments about it. And Christina uh, Feldman, for me, had a wonderful response to my question about this. Uh, she said, well, maybe first of all, there are different levels of jhana, and maybe there can be moments of jhana, flashes of jhana that become increasingly stabilized. And, you know, don't, don't get too attached to it all. Don't get attached to these systems. Uh, beware ideology and dogmatism here as in other things, and see what's helpful for you. Which goes to the question, why would intensely emotionally positive experiences be 
helpful in liberating ourselves from the habits of craving and the suffering that follows? I think there's several answers to that question. The first is that uh, as we experience stable, emotionally positive experiences, attention stabilizes as well, and we can develop greater and greater steadiness of mind. Technically, steadiness of mind basically translates to a kind of stability of what's in the field of awareness. Now, what could be in the field of awareness, in choiceless awareness or open awareness, just simply could be the streaming of your consciousness. But there's a stability of presence there. What enables stability of presence? rather than distractibility or being swept away. Technically, in the upper outer frontal regions of your own brain, that's more or less the neural substrates of working memory. Working memory being a kind of reverberative ongoingness of the sense of, of being present. What's there? What are you aware of? What, what are you with? Well, those physical, substrates up here have a kind of gate to them that is regulated by dopamine, a neurochemical that tracks reward. As reward, the sense of reward or the expectation of reward drops, whoop, dopamine levels drop. In those neural substrates, when dopamine levels drop, the gates open and a person can be distracted and new things can come flooding in. The very efficient mechanism, if you're a monkey in a tree and you're finished with your banana, reward drops, notice other bananas. On the other hand, when dopamine levels are steady, um, that keeps the gates closed. Unfortunately or fortunately, when there's a spike of possible reward, the gates open again. Like if a really appealing fellow monkey swings onto your tree. Like, what bananas? Who cares? Wow, right? Well, if we are experiencing really luscious, really high levels of emotionally fulfilling experience, dopamine levels are both steady and high. They're at their ceiling. So you can't get a spike, which keeps the gates closed to the neural substrates of working memory, thus promoting steadiness of mind. So I think that's one way in which um, PT and Sukha are really beneficial. A second is that they're motivating. If your practice is dull and painful, you have to really yell at yourself to get yourself to meditate, eh, it's hard to keep going, right? Um, there are aspects of practice that are challenging. Uh, so how do we help ourselves keep going? It's really motivating to to uh, experience joy and pleasure in your own practice. And um, bliss and happiness both help us to do that. Um, and intense experiences, certainly, of bliss and happiness can help you realize, as happened for me early on in one of my early meditation retreats, wow, wow, this is the real deal. Motivating, all right? Encouragement, as Judith puts it, to stay on the path. And then <clears throat> another thing that I find really, really interesting, and I don't know how to account for it neurologically. I know there's a lot of evidence from Barbara Fredrickson and other scholars uh, that emotionally positive experiences um, can have a tremendously reparative beneficial effect in your brain potentially also in terms of um, protecting and repairing telomeres, the caps on the ends of um, you know, the DNA uh, molecules, um, chromosomes and so forth, uh, and uh, can actually reduce some of the wear and tear that accompanies you know, age-related illnesses. Uh, there's a lot of evidence for the general benefits of emotionally positive experience. And one of the things I wanna kind of call out here is that intensely, positive, in which we're saturated by them, positive experiences, um, have a kind of cleansing effect on the mind. 
they're kind of purifying. It's like a clear, cool breeze blowing away the dusty, smoggy cobwebs inside your being. And something becomes purified increasingly when you're prepared to open to and let yourself have the gift of, you know, really rich, emotionally positive experiences. To finish, a key point, it's sometimes hard to imagine that contentment or tranquility could be an intense experience. But when nothing but contentment is present for you, it really is luscious and all enveloping. Same with tranquility. And Christina Feldman's counsel to me was to be prepared, uh, if it's effective for you, to shift your object of attention during meditation from um, something like the breath or a mantra or a word to shift it into uh, the sense of bliss in the body uh, or happiness or contentment or tranquility. So your object of attention can be, for example, happiness or contentment or tranquility, and you can become increasingly absorbed. It's an absorption practice in happiness or contentment or tranquility. And in that absorption is an intensity. Oh, you're full out. Uh, there's this funny metaphor. You know, the, the teachings in the Pali Canon come to us from a completely different time and culture and place, right? 2,500 years ago, uh, mostly preliterate, um, you know, a, kind of a feudal, highly patriarchal, um, you know, uh, culture. Uh, and one of the metaphors for how we should practice with bliss, which Christina would extend to, and I would also extend to, uh, less intense but still really rich experiences, which by the way, include uh, compassion and kindness. In many concentration retreats, or jhana retreats are called sometimes, they will take loving kindness, metta or compassion as the object of attention rather than the sensations of breathing to really strengthen concentration so that people become increasingly absorbed in lovingness, in, in warm-heartedness, in, Compassion, maybe, or joy, you know, joy for others. So you can use that also as one of these uh, experience, one of these emotionally positive experiences to become, you know, saturated in and and you know, marinating in. Anyway, so with regard to all that, the metaphor is come is translated as bath powder. And basically, apparently, there were powders, dry powders, there in ancient northern India, and if someone were to take a bath they would take this ball of powder and they would moisten it such that the moisture would spread throughout this ball of dry powder, bone dry powder, and touch every bit of it, right? So that it became as a whole more like dough of some kind, let's say. Anyway, the advice from the Buddha is to let your own emotionally positive experiences that are wholesome, you know, including PT and sukha, including, you know, bliss and happiness, to allow them to pervade yourself, to pervade your own body, like the moisture pervaded all those dry uh, bath powders. Isn't that a, like wild metaphor? So now I have a question for you, and then I'm going to open it up here. Um, and, uh, uh, To what extent are you allowing yourself to feel intensely happy or intensely grateful or intensely loving or intensely loved? You know, to what extent are you allowing yourself to feel intensely tranquil or content? And, and then to what extent are you allowing those qualities to pervade the whole field of awareness? You know, like the moisture pervading the powder fully. To what extent are you? For many people, they're very inhibited about allowing this to really happen. And maybe that's an additional fourth, perhaps, benefit of these practices because they involve a kind of kindness toward yourself. 
much as in the Buddha's story, when he was desperately hungry, he was emaciated, he was nearly dead, he was starving to death. Um, and he hearkened back to his own childhood and a wholesome experience of happiness in, in the first jhana there under the rose apple tree. And he realized it would be good for himself to let himself have that experience. It would be good to himself, you know? And we often are not that good to ourselves. So that's my question for you. In your own practice, can you engage this awakening factor? And you may not have much access to bliss, fear not. Um, there's a lot that can be done with a kind of marinating in and feeling pervaded by less intense, less exotic experiences like happiness, lovingness, um, around the edges of which may be anxiety or worry or sorrow, but still in the core of your being, you're, you're rested in, you're becoming absorbed in these emotionally positive experiences in, that include, of course, um, happiness, uh, contentment, and tranquility. Can you let yourself have these? Can you value these? Um, I can tell you candidly, as your friend in practice, that um, my own, I was introduced to um, meditation in 1974 and, and Dharma practice. Uh, and I was, you know, off and on, didn't really go very far with it. Uh, <clears throat> and then about 30 years ago, as you know, I got involved with Spirit Rock Meditation Center and, and some teachers there. Uh, my own practice really moved from that kind of superficial, you know, eh, casual uh, kind of place about it. Um, when first I started focusing on steadiness of mind, concentration, and absorbing and, and absorption, and really training, training the mind into, you know, concentration practices, valuing them which were left out in my own, uh, uh, in the teachings I received until that point in Western Buddhism, kind of devalued the right concentration, the jhanas aspect of the Eightfold Path, as well as other preliminary forms of steadying your mind. That was bum, for me at least, maybe for you, bum, uptick around focusing on steadiness of mind, including deep states of absorption. Second, next boom, was really appreciating the value of bliss and happiness, really appreciating the value of intensely positive states of mind that pervaded the mind, not out of craving, but increasingly actually out of internalizing them so that as I can do now with practice and experienced meditators can often do this, I can kind of drop in to that very pervading, beautiful state place, um, we can all develop that. So that's the second big step. And I'll tell you the third one, which is as a bonus and just to offer it to you for your own consideration, a movement into generosity, a kind of releasing of selfing and a moving out into the, the a, a, a generosity, a fundamental generosity of orientation. Those three have been really central for me in my own journey over the last 25 years, at least. Uh, anyway. Okay. Crazy stuff. So I'm seeing hands up. Goodness, goodness. Um, and uh, let's see. So uh, I'm going to start, and I'm going to ask you to be kind of, you know, succinct. Okay, great. So Lynn, I'm going to start with you. Uh, great. Thank you. And good to see you here. And I'm glad we have a chance to talk. And uh, uh, so I'm asking you to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. There we go. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Okay, <laughs> hi Rick. Hey. Um, I have this question and that is, if you know a particular activity brings you bliss aside from drugs or booze, yeah. is that an artificial thing? And I'll tell you what it is for me. It, this brings me fully to myself. And I, I, the word I would use is awe, but it, it's a form of bliss. I'm a singer. Ah, great, yeah. So, so when I get a chance to add the third part by ear and sing three-part harmony, my life comes together. I, right. I don't know how to explain that. There's just, it's vibrational, obviously. Yeah. So my question is, are there artificial things 
yeah. that you know sort of take you to that place of PT. Right. Uh, they're, if they work, they're not artificial. They, they genuinely work, right? And absolutely true. I do think there's um, a gentle encouragement from our teacher, the Buddha, to use vehicles like rafts as they are helpful to you and over time become increasingly independent of them. Not because there's anything bad about it, but without a particular practice such as singing, say, can a person in the quiet of their own um, sitting on the couch, you know, for 20 minutes in the morning, can there we open into what feel like really heartfelt and important, you know, sweet feelings. So nothing wrong. Fantastic. Uh, for some people, it's being in nature. It's singing to their grandchildren, you know, it's petting their cat. Great, great. And can we turn those states increasingly into a fundamental uh, sense of joyfulness deep, deep down inside ourselves that's with us wherever we go? So I would just leave you with that. I could see a lot of hands. I have not seen so many, so many hands <laughs> for a topic. And I'm going to keep going. And I want to make a key point here about something I saw that was a comment as well from someone. How do we drop into bliss with so much suffering in the world? Huge question. Uh, obviously, there was tremendous suffering in the time of the Buddha. And um, basically, we can have, be both. We can have an open heart while also finding you know, practices as we choose that seem wholesome and helpful to us. Our bliss does not increase their suffering. And um, denying uh, the, the available fruits of practice to ourselves um, does not make them suffer any less, you know? And okay, so I'll just go on. I'm going to keep moving. Kate, thank you. I'm kind of doing it in order in the ways in which the hands popped up. Uh, Great, Kate. Thank you. Uh, what do you do when you're meditating and you're opening yourself up to the state and you're working toward relaxation and to connect into bliss, but then your fear comes right in and anxiety comes right in? Yeah, it's very interesting. And um, it's, it's a, first of all, it's common. And then the question would be, huh, what what are you afraid of at that point? And maybe briefly, just you and me right now, if you're prepared to say, do you have a, any mindful sense of what is the fear about? What are you afraid of at that point? If I'm starting to relax, I'm afraid of having to face emotional pain. Okay, yeah. Well, that's, thank you for saying that. And um, that's one. Another one. I'll just name a couple others that I that I have heard of from people. Uh, being caught looking happy, <laughs> you know, based on our childhood experiences or other situations. Uh, there can be also a kind of survivor guilt. It's sort of related to what other people brought up that are, you know, how dare I feel happy when so much sorrow is going on in the world? And, you know, these are these are things. And then also sometimes there's a fear of like ego dissolution. You know, the kind of contracted, watchful, guarded, wary, top-down, tight, controlling, you know, executive process, it starts to relax even around joy and bliss. And it could feel like, ah, I'm losing control. Ah, you know, all these things could really happen. So then as a general approach, and I'm saying this to really just about everybody, because these are really common, is to be aware of it and then ask yourself essentially. Right now, is it actually true? So like right now, if I allow myself just sitting here in my sofa, in my home, to open into a, a deeper happiness or a calm, can I be aware of what's happening around me? You know, And also, can I do that without anything bad happening? The ceiling is not falling in. No one is jumping in through the window, right? The a fire is not breaking out in my kitchen. Oh, or you know, more broadly, can I uh, it, take in these experiences, which actually make me stronger 
while also keeping my eyes wide open and being determined about what's happening around me. Can I do both? Can I be a peaceful warrior? You know, can I be a happy, um, diligent person? You know, right? Both. And usually what and what will happen increasingly, and you kind of it grows out in a circle almost, you widen the space in which you're free, essentially. You push back the the bars of our invisible cages by realizing, no, I can have both. That was the Buddha's realization. I can have these wholesome pleasures without becoming a bliss addict. And in fact, as we actually let these experiences in, craving subsides. That's another major reason for allowing and opening to, you know, an intensity of well-being. Craving subsides. Okay? All right. Thank you. Keep on. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, Liz. Asking you to unmute. Hi, thank you for this absolutely wonderful talk. I'm in bliss. <laughs> I think I have come to a point. I'm 84, and recently I had this amazing. I realized I was clinging to my suffering. Ah. And I had a dream that half my body disappeared. The half that was holding all the suffering disappeared. And trees and plants. And grass replaced it. And Beautiful. I've been practicing for 25 years. I've lived in a monastery. And I've been clinging to my suffering till about three weeks ago. And it is a change of identity. That's it a great way to put it. A change yeah. of identity. Yeah. Yeah. And and also if 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 you have more joy, it does it, it's more helpful in dealing with people who are suffering. You have yeah. more energy to be with them. Yeah. More space to love them. Yeah. And thank you for this marvelous, oh, beautiful. Talk. Thank you. And and also, uh, there's not much time, but I just want to say that my toes keeps keeps t wanting to find my suffering, want keeps wanting to find my trauma, which is a process that I'm working with that I have to work mm -hmm. on. And then being in this bliss and this in this great happiness and contentment is healing of trauma, I believe. Oh, I think that's really exactly right. In. Well, I'm so glad you named that. That was really great for a lot and a lot of people, Liz, that this part of the healing of trauma, we, we feel damaged in our capacities, right? Including to feel joy and to realize that we have retained the capacity for joy. You know, uh, we are whole. We were not destroyed. And, and letting go of that identity is a big deal. Yeah. So thank you. It's a you. big deal and a wonderful thing. Thank All you right, so much. Great. Where so, can we find Christina Feldman's stuff? Oh, just search her name. She's written a lot of beautiful stuff. Um, you can just search on other books related to the jhanas and concentration practices. And um, and tell you what, everybody, it's 33 past the hour. With my blessing, you can leave if you want. I will keep going briskly with the remaining hands through Gloria. Um, and uh, so there you go, Gloria. You made it. <laughs> you got the end of the queue. And then I'll wrap up uh, and I'll move along fairly quickly too, if that's okay. Uh, okay, where are you, Gloria? That's great. Okay, good. Uh, so Tom, I'm asking you to unmute. I think you can unmute yourself too. Great. Hey, Tom, you got to unmute yourself. There yeah. you go. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Um, some of these states <clears throat> uh, seem to be pretty easy to approach yeah. and to uh, wrap my arms around. For example, loving kindness or mm -hmm. generosity. Um, these involve in my in steadiness of mind, these involve specific behaviors that I can identify and right. do. Or or they move into action. Yes, yeah, they move yeah. into action. Generosity is obvious. Yeah. Um bliss uh seems like one that I need to be not wary of but realize 
that I could fall into a trap of forcing it. That's right. You and know, that's the thing. You know, I okay, I'm blissful now. Yeah, totally right. Uh, I love the, if I could jump in just in the interest of time too, Tom. Um, and Tom's my friend, everybody, and longtime, you know, comrade in, in this uh, uh, meditation gathering here. Uh, the traditional, uh, I like the invocation, may PT arise, may bliss arise. It's a may it arise. There's an invitation to it. It's gentle. And sometimes it comes and sometimes it doesn't. A lot of times it doesn't because bliss is intense. Real bliss is intense. You might feel pulses of it. There might be an opening to it. Um, on something like a sustained day of meditation or week of meditation, yeah, it becomes much more accessible as we become calmer and steadier. I do find um, access to gratitude. Gratitude does not particularly move into action. You can find gratitude. Um, I know you as someone who experiences a lot of joy, like in beauty or in creativity. I also know you as someone who is extremely generous in your nature and loving. You can find joy in your own lovingness. Just the joy, the gladness in lovingness is available. These are all available to us. So I'm, right? Yeah. And um, we can invite them and start having more and more access to them. It, as you all know, or most know, you know, states are what enable traits. We have to start with states of being, experiences. So we start with these experiences, but as we internalize them, we develop trait happiness, trait joy, tra trait gratitude, trait lovingness. And traits foster states. As you increasingly develop these traits, you can more and more access them or open to them at will. And when you invite them, they're, they're much more accessible to you over time. Okay? Okay, hopefully that was relevant. Monica, I'm asking you to unmute. Monica, great. Hi, Rick. Yes, uh, hi. Thank you for your presentation today. It was really advanced and in a very interesting way. Um, my question is, you mentioned how you sort of went to the next level of meditation yeah. to like steadiness of mind and to really go deeper i think i am at that point that i would like to explore so where or really oh, yeah. like uh, uh, what kind of um teacher not teachers necessarily but institutes you mentioned somewhere that you went and yeah oh very good so um i think i'll actually give a whole talk on that topic because there many of many of you all have a significant practice and you're kind of looking to like the next place or opening or you know forgive the word level but yeah deeper um <clears throat> uh well I'll take a couple things one I do think there's a place for a bit of study and finding a book um like uh you know a a book on mindfulness or a kind of classic book, What the Buddha Taught. Uh, you know, there are probably some other basic books just, you know, to make sure you, you kind of understand the basics. Uh, I wish I had a better recommendation in the moment. Um, if you're looking for something hardcore but incredibly uh, clear and accessible, yeah, okay, great. The book Sati Patana by the monk Analyo. A-N-A-L-A-Y-O. I personally think uh, if you're going to take one Buddhist book to a desert island, uh, that would be the one I'd recommend to you. Uh, and what I, is the title of his book? Uh, yeah. Sati Patana. The Sati Patana essentially is uh, mindfulness and or the foundations or establishments of mindfulness. So S-A-T-I P-A-T-T I'm tired, so I'm losing my spelling. H I N A. Yeah. So Elaine put it in. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, Satipatthana. That book, fantastic book. Second, um, I would, gosh, I think Tara Brock's book, uh, Trusting the Gold, is a complete gem. Yep. I recommend my book, Neurodharma, frankly. Uh, it's, okay. It's very, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very, so I'll leave you with those. 
I'd, and I'd, places, I, eventually you'll mention it in your next talk or when you... Yeah, finding a good teacher. And uh, if you want, Shyla Catherine, Shyla Catherine teaches uh, uh, concentration practices and she has programs online. I also highly recommend Stephen Snyder, who has practiced in both Zen and Theravadan and is, you know, maybe the most realized person I know individually. Steven Snyder. Uh, you can locate him online, at, you know, if you just look for that. And he his books are amazing. Uh, there's so much depth to them. They're so profound. Okay, I better keep going. But thank you, Monica. That's a great question. And I honor your aspiration. Thank honor you. Your no, aspiration. I, yeah. I, Greg, I am inspired by you and many others. So thank you. So thank you very much. Namaste. Okay. Namaste. Uh -huh. Okay, whoops, uh, hang on a second. I'm gonna ask you to unmute Asher and Gloria. You're not yet ready, sorry, you're next. I, I pushed the wrong button, there you go. Okay, Asher. Hey, Rick, big fan. I uh, actually recently just found out about this, so this is uh, it's pretty cool. Ah, um, I'm going hardcore tonight, nothing <laughs> held back, so yeah. for better um, or worse. For sure, this is kind of like a two-part question. Okay. Um, could you speak briefly on what you would say skillful ways of dealing uh, with the ending of a relationship in which you're still attached to. And then the second part of that is within your talk, you're talking about, let's say, cultivating these, uh, let's say, states of blissfulness. Do you think that someone in mourning or grief, do you, would you say that's sort of a healthy thing to do as meaning kind of like a Band-Aid type? Yeah. Or put you, potential of pushing the grief down by cultivating this ha happy state. I, that's sort of my two-part question. It's a deep question, and and um, if I follow it, uh, I think that when relationships end, often um, there's there's a there's a kind of response to it. I'm I'm uh, along the lines of of course I'm sad, of course uh, things are difficult. I had a wrenching conversation with someone um, earlier today, and. Frankly, I still feel like I got punched in the pit of my stomach, and I have a lot. I have a lot of practice, and man, I, I'm still upset about it, and that's okay. That's what the Buddha called the first darts. You know, it just we're we're social mammals. We're big monkeys. Of course, we're freaked out. Of course, we're sad. Of course, we're angry. Of course, we feel guilty. Of course, we second guess ourselves. Of course, we wish other people were you know better people or whatever. You know, and to bring that kind of benediction to yourself. Of course, I'm bothered by that. You know, like that's I think a really important thing um, to and to give it time. I think that's really important to give it time, and to I'm actually teaching a workshop on rumination uh, uh, on Saturday. You know, this is a timely topic. Uh, it's it's important to let go, you know, and to beware of the mind's tendency to keep coming back to that bone to keep poking that cold sore on the inside of your cheek with your tongue to see if it's still there and to shift into a letting go mode. And then finishing, uh, what you said is really right. Sometimes when we're in the middle of grieving and mourning, uh, these more positive states are like trying to light a fire with wet wood. No way, no way. But I'll ask you, um, can you still amidst the grief, the loss, and all the rest, can you find an underlying sense of feeling content in this life, which can include the sorrow and the, and the grief? Maybe not, but that's interesting, right? Maybe right now you can't find, you know, a saturating bliss or even happiness, but underneath it all, can you find or can you find a fundamental underlying acceptance of life as it is in gratitude, you know, no matter what? And can you increasingly kind of rest in that gratitude or peacefulness? That's a real question. And then even, you know, most deeply, and can you locate a kind of core in yourself or a, a ground or level in yourself that's just inherently content, inherently at peace. 
uh, which includes obviously speaking truth to power, standing up for others, you know, pursuing important goals. That, that that's kind of higher up, right? In on a ground of an underlying intrinsic wakefulness, peacefulness, and open heartedness. Thank you. What do you, yeah. Okay, I'll leave those as questions for yeah, you. Yeah, no, it's great. Thank you. Yeah. And you could see I made a little bit of a distinction between that first question and the second. The first one is it's not really about accessing the deepest layers of our being, which, in my view, edge into that which is unconditioned, you know, and mysteriously eternal. But minimally, you know, in, in our own ordinary mind, there's still a deep, deep layer up from that in the, my first question was more situational, like, yeah, even though certain things suck, still fundamentally, am I, am I glad for the ride of a human life, right? Okay. All right. Last and thank you, not least, Gloria here asking you to unmute, finishing up. Great. Gloria. Yeah. Okay. Finally. Yes. Yes, you're on. Great. Yes. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you even for Saturday. Oh, you're but, welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a lot, but but anyhow, it was nice to see your energy there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I am trying to do a resume. When we are talking about the seven facts, that is mindfulness, investigation, energy, bliss, and tranquility, but they are all interact interactive. And there are seven facts of meditation, of, of what? I'm, if I follow you right, uh, so we have these seven things that we all have a sense of, right? Maybe some are more subtle, like concentration, you know, you know but still we have a sense of what it is to be really steady in our present moment awareness and and even equanimity we we have a sense of emotional balance that's a better sense okay okay so if i understand you we have and i'll finish with this kind of succinctly we have uh, mindfulness uh, investigation energy or effort uh bliss and i'm including its close friend uh happiness PT. yeah yes. pt and sukha here as well as tranquility, got five, yeah, and then concentration and equanimity. Okay, those are the seven. And so, okay, so what's your? Did you did you have a question? Uh, let me just say this: these seven, right? They're useful in everyday life, and you can look at them almost like a checklist. And you could think to yourself, you know, for this year, two thousand and twenty-three, or maybe this month or maybe this day, I'm gonna focus on one of the seven. You could even rotate, you could even assign, this is good, one, you know, Mindfulness Monday, Mindful Monday, Investigatory Tuesday. You know, you could work your way through to Equanimity Sunday and then start over again. You could practice that just in everyday life. Also, in the Buddhist tradition, certainly, and I think you find other versions of this in other traditions, these are factors of the highest reaches of human potential. And as they get perfected, we move up the mountain of awakening and become increasingly stabilized um, in awakened consciousness. So both are true, both in everyday life and in our own meditative and personal path of awakening. 